Good evening, everyone. Thank you again for coming. This is our last Great Decisions program of the um, year. So, and today we're going to be talking about climate change. Um, U.S. President Donald Trump left many scratching their heads when it was rumored that he was looking to purchase the large island nation of Greenland from Denmark. Yeah, that was kind of funny, I thought, too. <laughs> While any potential deal seemed highly unlikely, the event shows the changing opinion within the U.S. government towards engagement with the Arctic region. Because of climate change, large sheets of Arctic ice are melting, exposing vast stores of natural gas and oil. With Russia and China already miles ahead with their Arctic strat strategies, can the U.S. catch up? So our presenter today is Elizabeth Wheat. She is an associate um, professor and pre-law advisor at the University of Wisconsin, um, Green Bay. Um, she also is an associate professor in public and environmental affairs, political science, environmental science and policy, and master of science in, sus in sustainable management programs. Her fields of interest are envi environmental law, civil rights and liberties, environmental justice, international law, and org organizations, model UN, and simulations in the classroom. Her research focuses on environmental law cases before the U.S. Courts of Appeal, Appeals and experiential learning in the classroom, such as model United Nations and mock trials. Elizabeth has received several teaching fellowships to further develop her research on the scholarship of teaching and learning. Her PhD is in political science from Western Michigan University. She has a master's in comparative environmental policy from Indiana University and got her bachelor's degree in psychology at Alma College. Um, but yes, very impressive, I agree. Especially the law part. I was reading through it, I thought, wow, this is pretty, pretty nice. Environmental policy, um, these are the classes that she has taught. Environmental policy, environmental law, natural resources law and policy, international law, global politics, and global environmental policies. So let's welcome Elizabeth, and we'll get started. That's the short list of the classes I've taught. When you're in four different departments, the list gets a little too long, so you just pick your favorites for the, the bio. Uh, thank you so much for coming out tonight. It's nice to be able to be back in person again. I know last year um, kind of put a pause on, on everything, so it's, I really appreciate everyone coming out. This is a particularly exciting time to be doing this talk because on Sunday, October 31st, um, the Conference of Parties of the Paris Agreement will be meeting in Glasgow. And this was postponed from last year. And um, as of now, Russia and China are not planning to send um, either of their leaders. Um, Biden, I believe, is leaving, I think he's traveling Saturday um, for it. Um, so it's a really exciting, very timely time. And we'll see what, you know, what comes out of Paris. They're a little short on the financial commitments. But uh, I'm hopeful that some of the issues that we'll cover tonight with the Arctic will be discussed at, um, at the summit as well. So with the Great Decisions, they take much more of a foreign policy and national security approach, which I think is really valuable. But I wanted to add in some of the environmental and political discussions. And so I'll give you a brief roadmap of what we're going to cover. We'll look at the environmental factors, geographic importance, some of the political implications, national security concerns, and some what I think are some future issues to be mindful of. Here you see a couple of pictures that um, a friend of mine has taken. She is getting her PhD in Toronto, looking at microplastics in the Arctic. So she has done her best to help me with pronunciations tonight. So um, I'll at least deliver it convincingly, even if they're terribly wrong. Uh, so the gentleman you see on the right here, his name is uh, Muk, I believe. Um, and this is in Nunavut, uh, Canada, um, which is going to be in Byron Bay on Victoria Island. And so he is standing there with some dried char, and you can see some of the traditional fishing on there. And a lot of my friend's research is working with indigenous people and learning about the Arctic and, and sea melt there. And so we'll start with the Arctic states themselves. This includes the U.S. by way of Alaska, Canada, Denmark, by way of Greenland, Norway, Russia, Iceland, Sweden, and Finland. And there's a couple of different regional differences here. We have the European Arctic, which will be Greenland to Russia via Norway, much more densely populated than the North American Arctic. And the largest Arctic city is going to be in Russia at about 300,000 people. 
For the North American Arctic, this will include Northern Canada and Alaska. The Arctic Council is going to be one of our really important organizations um, to work in this area, and this includes states, permanent participants, working groups, and observers, and we'll talk about each of those. This is a consensus-based organization, so every member has to agree on whatever policy they're going, putting forth. It was established in 1996, and its purpose was to try and unify the Arctic states, indigenous people, and residents in the area. This is the main governmental forum for this region. Iceland is just wrapping up their time as chair from 2019 through 2021, and Russia will take over shortly. So as I said, this is a very interesting time to be looking at all of these issues, especially as um, Russia is really, really chomping at the bit to expand their shipping. The six permanent participants are organizations that represent Arctic indigenous groups, and they have full consultation rights with the council. The working groups that you see listed tend to focus more on issues. So you'll have a working group on contaminants, monitoring and assessment, flora and fauna, emergency preparedness, the marine environment, and sustainable development. For the observers, they'll work largely with these working groups. There are 13 non-Arctic countries that include France, United Kingdom, Singapore, China, uh, and Spain, among others. 13 intergovernmental and interparliamentary groups and then 12 approved NGOs. So you really get a lot of different kinds of people that are engaging with the council. They've negotiated a number of legally binding agreements among the Arctic Eight, and a few of those will look at aeronautical and maritime searches. You're a very remote area, right? You wanna be good at, at finding people and, and finding things. Marine oil pollution preparedness, and Arctic scientific cooperation. And then lastly, and what I think is one of the most important and I think growing areas with the Arctic is the role of the indigenous people in, in every aspect of the policy. There are over 4 million people that live in the Arctic state's northern provinces. 10% of those are indigenous and many are distinct to the Arctic, so they're only located in that particular area. And there are 11 distinct native cultures, many of whom are dependent on the migratory caribou and the Arctic fisheries. And we'll talk more about their role as we go. Next, we'll look at some of the different environmental factors. And you can't have a talk on the Arctic without at least one polar bear picture. <laughs> so starting first with the landscape. Give you a sense of what day and night feels like. It is all daylight from early April till early September. And then no direct sunlight from early October through March. The warmest day, which might be even cold by our standards, is about 40 degrees in July. And so for friends that do research in the Arctic, their suits um, make Packers fans in December look pretty tropical. You have pretty high, uh, we're starting to see high temperatures in, in these areas, which is a little bit concerning. So even though 40 is still kind of low, it's high, higher for the Arctic. In a spring and tw summer 2020, we saw a really big jump in the trends. And so we're kind of watching the, um, the numbers here pretty closely. So beginning with some of the climate change risk factors, we know that the polar regions are really important barometers of global warming. And over time, we're seeing the warming continue. The recent UN report in preparation of, of Sunday's summit, um, they're now projecting about a 2.7 degree increase. Remember, their goal had been 1.5. And so we're seeing these trends get really, really dangerous um, very quickly. And this is gonna have really big effects on marine food systems, especially those in, in the Arctic. So there are a few different kind of problems to think about when we're looking at the food web and the ecosystem. The first is a declining sea ice. With the melting, you have rising sea levels and more extreme weather events in the Arctic. And we've watched a lot of the, uh, the Greenland ice sheet falling, and this is a trend of pretty significant ice loss. And it's being experienced also in Alaska and Arctic Canada. If you want to watch a really good documentary on this with just phenomenal photography, they basically created new cameras to film this. It's called Chasing Ice. There was an exhibit in Chicago at Shedd Museum for a little while too, but the documentary is just extraordinary to really get a sense of, they do some time-lapse photography. We never had observed these ice sheets falling this way until kind of this documentary came out. Another pr problem with the food web and ecosystems is the declining sea ice thickness. We're simply not seeing the ice be as thick, and so I'll show you a couple slides in a, in a bit 
where um, there's not, simply not as much ice and it's not getting as cold for as long and that's also going to have effects on, on the ecosystems too. Next change is changes in the air temperature and sea ice. Tundras like what we have in the, Alaska, in Alaska, the Arctic area are really sensitive to air temp temperatures. And so when the air temperature is changing, the vegetation is going to be affected. And then also the ocean surface temperatures will be affected. And so all of that is going to be tied to both the absence and, and presence of ice. Related to that is the snow cover. The snow cover in this area has the effect of controlling a lot of the wildlife activity in the northern latitudes. So when it's warmer, there's more fuel availability, so you get actually more fires. And so a lot of the Arctic fires are going to be in the um, taiga boreal forest, which is one of the world's largest terrestrial biomes. We don't think about fires in this part of the world, we think of glaciers, but that's sort of one of the new effects that we're observing. And then we have a permafrost coastal erosion. Most of the people in this region are living in these coastal zones. And it's also the area where there's the most industrial, commercial, uh, tourism, and military activities. And the air temperatures, the storminess of the water, sea ice, conditions of the ocean, all of those are going to factor in to this permafrost changing. And then the per as the permafrost erodes, you also get more CO2 and methane that's going to be released. And so climate change is both causing the permafrost erosion and then the permafrost erosion is also continuing the climate change. And so it's a, the worst kind of cycle that, that we're able to, we're seeing in this area. Another big challenge with the landscape are microplastics. And I'll, I'll show you a few charts in, um, next on this. But these are plastics that are really traveling through the ocean currents and through air. And they can accumulate in animals, and they can really spread everywhere. And there's a lot of risks of contaminants um, with traveling through soot, you get methane, uh, other pesticides. And with the Arctic specifically, we're observing really high concentrations of microplastics in the sea ice. Some of the highest concentrations on the planet are in Arctic Ocean surface water. So so they're basically moving from all around the world and kind of gathering in this in the spot. And so the sea ice will transport it and, and store it. With the animals, we're finding microplastics in the stomachs of polar fish, blue mussels, and snow crabs. And so this naturally suggests issues with human consumption. And now we're able to minimize our consumption. We certainly have a lot of other options. But if you're in the Arctic and it's a subsistence lifestyle, you're relying on, on this marine food web. And so you're at tremendous risk when you have um, these microplastics that are, that are accumulating. And so this one will show you um, how the microplastic pollution contaminates the Arctic. And so you see at the beginning, uh, basically the, the tire fabrics and all the products disintegrate into the small particles. From there, they're going to deposit in the sea. They break down even smaller, then get picked up by the wind and thermal conditions, transported through the air, and then you end up essentially clouds and falling snow to trap them, lands on the Arctic ice and sea surface, and kind of gets contaminated with the animals and, and the sediment there as well. This one, um, you can see the so over the last decade, um, there are concentrations of plastic litter, including microplastics, so it's not exclusively plastics, all over the Arctic beaches. And I'm trying to see the key on here. The, the blue dots, which might be a little bit harder to see, is beach, um, but you can see the yellow ones, probably the most prominent, are surface. So we've detected a lot of those microplastics and pollution on the surface. And it's coming from other places and essentially compiling there. Looking at the species, uh, as I mentioned, this is a really sensitive ecosystem. And it's home to about 21,000 known species of cold adapted plants, animals, and microbes. And the habitat itself is really special. It's going to be uh, important for resting, so walruses will leave their calves while they're diving for food. Polar bears are very similar. And it's going to play an important role for travel, hunting, and mating, especially with polar bears. It can provide protections from predators, so with the really thick ice, the narwhals that you see featured here can uh, get protection from the orcas. And then animals such as the arctic fox, um, when the sea ice is melting, that's going to influence their range. 
and the because the tree lines will move. You also see some of the migration routes changing again for the, the orcas on that. Caribou will also be affected by the migration routes, and this is in a couple of different ways. As the temperatures increase, some of the rivers that used to be frozen that they would cross are now thawing, and so they'll drown in the rivers as they're trying to cross. And then you also see plants that are now covered with ice instead of snow. So they can't forage through the snow to get food in the way that they could when it was just, again, just snow. So that food shortage also threats to their life with the water. Um, and for people, a lot of indigenous groups are dependent on the caribou. It's really been a, a challenge on that. And then for just to feature a couple of the unique ones on here, we have the Saima ringed seal. There are 350 of these left in Finland. It's actually their only home in the world. And the concern with the, with the seals is that the snow isn't deep enough on the lake anymore to build their birthing dens. And so they essentially don't have an area to, to be as safe and, and protect. So very concerned about kind of the long-term survival there. And then with the polar bears, as there's less sea ice, they have to travel further for food. They, they spend more time on land and you see their survival rates decline. The projections for polar bears are losing 30% of the world's population by 2050. Um, and that is very likely a conservative estimate on that. Um, the recent IPCC report is, is worse. And so um, we're you know, not doing great on, on that. And so there's a huge risk to those species. A couple of at-risk species, uh, the narwhal, as I mentioned, they need thick ice for protection from the orcas. They're also at a risk for effects from industrial activities and shipping. So we'll talk about the shipping routes in a bit, but as these routes potentially open up, you're going to have more ships coming through, more harm for some of these already at-risk animals. And then with the walruses, as they're forced more on land and on shore, disturbance from people, aircraft issues, and then they're also uh, essentially more at risk for polar bear um, as, a, as a main predator. Fisheries, I think, are one of the most important aspects um, with this area. It's nicknamed the blue economy. Large portions of the Arctic communities work in fishing and they're dependent on it. And so in Greenland alone, just one small part of the Arctic community, fisheries are over 90% of their ex exports and a key source of jobs and food for the population. The annual catch in the Arctic is going to be about 2.5 million tons. And 99% of that is from commercial and artisanal fishers, 1% subsistence. And so this is a huge commercial, globally uh, important area. The Arctic fish have adapted to this area. They're used to the temperatures, but they have a really narrow temperature range that they can survive in. So as the temperature of the water is changing, the range of the fish is changing. And this is going to cause a whole host of political issues because there are certain laws that we'll talk about that protect the fish within a certain area and that set rules for the governments within a certain area. So if the fish move, um, you have new fishing grounds, and then those new fishing grounds are not covered or protected by any regional organization or by any law. And so it is essentially a potential free-for-all with that, which is concerning um, from an environmental standpoint too. We also potentially in this area with the fisheries have increased CO2 levels. And so um, as the ocean becomes more acidic, this is gonna harm a lot of the invertebrates, especially those with shells, because the shells won't get strong enough. So they're not gonna be able to survive in, in that ecosystem. There's been discussion of fishing and commercial development in, uh, in the US. It's called the EEZ, which is the Exclusive Economic Zone. And there really hasn't been any regulation of commercial fisheries in the Arctic um, other than you know, some of the effects on the, on the species. In 2018, we do see a moratorium on commercial fisheries, sorry, on fishing in the central Arctic Ocean. And we may need more of these kinds of moratoriums in other areas, depending on, on where the fish move to. The US has a real, we have a series of fishery management councils, and our US Northern Pacific Fisheries Management Council, the mouthful, uh, has a really good example of, it's called this ecosystem-based management philosophy, where you look at the whole ecosystem. You don't just look at the fish, you don't just look at the polar bears, you look at the connection between that ecosystem and the animals in it. And the European Union is starting to adopt a similar philosophy. Which I think is a, it's a good trend. You're really thinking much more holistically and less, um, you know, how much can we fish and eat, okay? And there's calls, and we'll see if this comes up next week, but there are calls for a potential fishery management and international Arctic body. 
We have a couple international organizations that do work on, on fisheries issues, but there isn't one focused on, on the Arctic, so that could be a really exciting area. Now shifting gears a bit, looking at some of the research stations. Uh, it was very difficult to only pick three because um, when you start falling down the rabbit hole of what these Arctic stations look like, it just makes you feel cold. Um, fascinating, but very, very cold. And I think these are really critical for understanding climate change and for researching this area uh, and also helping with those search and rescue operations. Multiple governments have permanent research stations up here. Uh, so you'll see a few of these Arctic research stations station, polar stations, and ice stations. Uh, these are, ice stations can be constructed on land or ice that rests on land. And some, my personal favorites, just drift out on the sea ice. So you're just, just hanging out in your little sea ice research hut in the Arctic where it's difficult to rescue you and very cold. My friend loves it. She's, she loved every second of it. And I was like, I just kind of want to curl up in a blanket whenever you tell me a story. Um, but it's, it's really cool to kind of hear what they do. And uh, a lot of the stations, I know the Ca Canadians uh, are particularly good with this. I think I'm less familiar with the US. But the Canadians really work to partner with indigenous people in the area. So the indigenous people who have had a subsistence lifestyle play a really important role. They, they know the area and um, they're really, I think, important partners in, in the science here. A um, couple of highlight of monitoring assessment programs to highlight, there's one called AMAP, which is the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program. And there's another one that's called Protection of the Marine Environment. And those both do um, really cool reports. They're focused on the Arctic. So if you ever want to have a really nerdy science deep dive on this, um, check out some of the AMAP reports. The alert station is one I think I want to highlight. This is a Canadian station. It's under command of the Royal Canadian Air Force. It's the most northerly permanently inhabited location in the world, uh, 817 kilometers from the North Pole. They signal intelligence facilities for the Canadian military operations, and there's about 55 full-time military and civilian personnel at that station. Um, so you can see all the different designs. Like I said, I only picked a few countries up here. Um, they just look cold. Um, Russia's kind of interesting with like, the little bubble dome system that they have, but uh, a lot of the governments have it because I just picked three for, for today. Beginning to the, like, at the geographic importance, um, as you mentioned, the, it's a really cool environmental area. And so the ecosystem itself, the natural resources, and the research opportunities are, are abundant. Uh, we've observed that the shifting location of the global fish stock and of the fisheries. But what's going to become really critical, especially with, with Russia chairing the council and, and Russia's beliefs on shipping, is the oil and natural gas availability. There are estimates that about 13% of undiscovered oil and 30% of undiscovered gas can be found in the Arctic. And so there could be a potential very quite decently sized uh, revenue here. With the trade in shipping, as the sea ice melts, new navigable shipping routes will be opening. And one of the important parts and necessary parts for this are the icebreaker ships. Different countries have different resources on that, but these are ships that literally go in front of the freighters and break the ice. And so right now you have to have certain kinds of icebreakers to get through certain routes. As these routes change, the, I'll show you a chart in a little bit, the projections are that eventually you won't need an icebreaker. A regular freighter can just go through. That's how the proje warming projections are, are going right now. And then uh, with some of the military and national security ones, we'll get more into that in, in the next couple of slides, but this really is a very critical area in terms of the location. So this will be the sea ice changes from 1985 to 2018. So the whiter it is, the older it is. So you can see on the left, we had um, ice age. See, the sea ice age was up four years or more. And then by the time you get to 2018, you have much, much younger ice. It's just not staying as cold for as long. And so you can see much you know, darker bluer, which is um, the younger ice. This is probably the most depressing chart of the night. This is going to look at what they argue is the inevitability of the Arctic ice melting. And essentially this is melting much, much faster than we had ever imagined. And so um, 
it's it's been going on for for a while, but the net, the current projections and the font may be a little too small to read. But the, the Arctic Ocean may be ice free for part of the year at some point between 2044 and 2067. And so, which is again incredibly alarming that it would get that warm to have um, have that little ice melt. All right, into the more political side. So as you can tell from the bio, I do a little bit of environment, a little bit of politics, and so this is kind of a blend of, of all my favorite things. I'll start first at the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Uh, Law of the Sea and Arctic Council agreements have been really important for keeping a stable political environment. And this particular agreement will govern offshore resources. So a coastal state has a right to explore and extract marine resources within that EEZ, that exclusive economic zone. That's going to be 200 nautical miles off your coast. So up to 200 miles, explore, extract, have a good time. Beyond that area, it's considered op called open to consultation. And so if a state can prove, by state we mean country, if a country can prove that the seafloor is an extension of its continental shelf, then you can extract beyond that 200 miles. Okay, and so the states really have to um, prove quite a bit here. Now, catch, the US has signed, but we have not ratified this convention. And so we cannot file any claims under the law. Um, and there's a, you can debate for international law people for days on why the US has not signed this and whether or not they should. But when it comes to Arctic disputes, not being part of this convention really could cause problems further on down the road. For the convention on the limits of the continental shelf, basically an extension of law of the sea, Arctic states can submit claims to get a larger share of the shelf. And that larger share enables you to extract more resources and fish more. And this is another way to help states implement law of the sea and can also help establish those claims beyond that, that 200 nautical miles. The Arctic strategy is from 2013, a little bit different. This was a strategy under President Obama and three key areas of, of focus. To advance U.S. security interests, pursue responsible Arctic region stewardship, and strengthen international cooperation. And for President Obama, cooperation with the Alaskan natives and indigenous populations was really important. And when he visited in 2015, um, the U.S. was the chair at that point, the Arctic Council adopted a scientific cooperative agreement that both recognized climate change, which a little bit late on that one, but better than never, and emphasized the effect of the changing sea ice on the area, particularly on indigenous communities. The Obama administration really had pushed discussions of environmental justice, but we'd never really talked about it that much in the Arctic context. And so that was a really big step to, to note that. Um, the council's role changed largely with Finland in, in 2017, um, because that is going to coincide with the Trump administration in the United States. Um, and the interests will shift dramatically with the Arctic at that point, and really shifting more from a diplomacy track to more of a military security emphasis. In 2019, Secretary of State Pompeo said the Arctic was an area for power and competition, especially when it came to Russia and China. And so this is a really big change from diplomacy and indigenous research. And Pompeo will call for a much stronger engagement in the Arctic. And then the part you've all been waiting for, the Greenland debate. So the Arctic is an important area for missile defense capability, surveillance infrastructure, and some strategic forces. Okay? There's potential for a Navy and the Coast Guard, but we haven't, the US has not invested much there yet. In 2019, the Trump administration discussed wanting to buy Greenland, later claimed it was a joke. Uh, but we see a few efforts after that make you think that it wasn't really quite as much of a joke as they, they had kind of played it off to be. In 2020, there's a guidance document uh, on safeguarding the Arctic that includes equipping a new fleet of icebreakers. Now, if you don't care about an area, why are you sending icebreakers? In 2020, there's a new State Department Arctic coordinator that's put in place. This one I didn't really take issue with because the US plays an important role in the Arctic. We should have had someone coordinating this before. I'm just suspect of the motivations a little bit. 
at the end of the day, we don't buy Greenland, but we give $12 million in aid for economic development that focused on developing energy, natural resources, expanding education, and increasing tourism. So we're still invested, but we didn't buy it. So it's kind of where that one lands. And then talking about a few of the political considerations, there's a lot of interesting countries, so I just picked a few here. As I mentioned, the location of the Arctic is really important. And during the Cold War, this was a, a critical area for the, the superpower standoff, right? And has played a really strategic role in US, Soviet Union, now Russia competition. So we will start with Russia. They have thousands of miles of territory and coastline, about 24,000 miles of coastline above the Arctic Circle. And two main economic interests for Russia, they are well positioned to exploit oil and natural gas in the region. 70% of Russia's reserves are on the continental shelf, most in the Arctic. Um, so this is a huge, huge area for Russia. Their second economic interest is they are positioned very well with geography and logistically with the shipping routes. So because they are right there, they're going to know about the shipping routes, can develop those, and as, those, as that sea ice declines, they're going to get first crack essentially at, um, at, as the new routes open up. And we're, the projections are they would expand in Siberia first. So most remote area, not terribly profitable at the moment, really could change as, as these routes open up. Russia wants to become much more of a maritime trading partner and to reestablish their military power and this would, would help them do that. They have a northern fleet that's based on the Kola Peninsula and they also have strategic submarines which are really important for their status as a nuclear power. Um, so right now they're, they're relatively unobstructed with establishing power in, in the area and they have a monopoly on guided icebreaker escorts through that northern sea route. Um, so they have basically the world's largest icebreaker fleet. If you want to go through there, you're most likely going to have to use a Russian icebreaker. Uh, not all, all, all shady though. They have helped with a really cool research expedition called Mosaic. And this is a partnership with 20 different countries, including the US, China, and Russia. That's a really exciting research partnership. But um, most of their interests in the area have been economic and, and military. You might be surprised to see China on here next and wonder if you're rusty on, on your geography for a second. Uh, China is not considered an Arctic state and they are largely excluded from politics in the region, but they want to be much more involved. And so their closest territory is actually 5,000 miles uh, by sea from the Bering Strait. They have an observer status in the Arctic Council. Their new icebreaker is also working with that mosaic project and they've commissioned, commissioned a nuclear icebreaker as of 2018. So now Russia and China are the only countries to have new, to operate nuclear icebreakers. And this is considered to be part of their Polar Silk Road Initiative. You may have heard of China's Belt Road Initiative. This is the cold weather version. And so it's a 2008 collaboration with other countries to develop Arctic shipping routes. Could cooperate with Russia, waiting to see on that, but it's a big part of their, their long-term interest in minerals and Arctic energy resources. For Canada, Canada controls the northern, um, Northwest Passage. They're considered an internal territory. It goes you know, right through the middle of Canada. They coordinate very closely with the US. It's been, a, it's been a helpful partnership there. They have a number of research icebreakers, and these have really state-of-the-art research capabilities on the ships themselves. A lot of joint efforts with scientific cooperation, information sharing, joint military. And with Canada, they have also been developing sustainable shipping lanes through the Arctic waters. So really thinking about how you can minimize the environmental harm as you go through. And they've committed to decreasing the use of highly polluting heavy, heavy fuel oils in the Arctic waters. And these are going to be things that as the Arctic opens up, we really want to be keeping in mind to minimize that risk for those ecosystems. And one specific Canadian example um, that anyone with young children or grandchildren knows about is NORAD, also tracking Santa. When they're not tracking Santa, it is the North American Aerospace Defense Command, and this helps monitor and detect um, things in, North, in the airspace and can warn of attacks. So it's a good, you want Canada to be on your friend, uh, be on, on your good side with, with this one. Um, with Denmark and Greenland, 
In addition to what we already mentioned, um, these last three countries are in an interesting position because they're all in NATO, they're all receiving economic interest from China, and they're all feeling a lot of pressure from Russia with their military buildup. Greenland is a really unique political situation, so they, they control their own domestic issues, but the Danish government controls foreign affairs and defense. And over time, China has been heavily investing in mining, airport construction, and real estate. And so there's international concern over whether this investment from China could lead to blocking NATO later on. Russia also uses the airspace, um, and that's put a little more tension, I think, for, for everyone in the region. And there's been an increase in U.S. diplomacy, as you saw with the Greenland discussion, but the U.S. has also encouraged Denmark to increase its own military and push back on the Chinese influence. And so we reopened a U.S. consulate in Greenland and then gave the aid that I mentioned a bit earlier. Russia has upgraded its airbase in the area, and um, so you sort of have the Russian airbase competing with the, the Greenland airbase, and they're both important to um, missile defense systems, particularly the U.S. one. For Iceland, Iceland has no standing military of its own, so they rely entirely on the U.S. and NATO for their defense. Uh, they have also expanded their diplomatic and economic ties with China. Geothermal came in 2012, free trade 2013, more scientific research in 2018. All of this has led up to Chinese investment now making up 6% of Iceland's GDP and 11% of Greenland's GDP. So when I say China is investing, they're investing millions and millions into, into these countries. In 2006, U.S. military troops left Iceland and basically said Iceland needed to um, have its own national security policy. But in 2019, the U.S. Pentagon gave money to expanding and upgrading the runway and facilities at the airfield. So you see a common theme with these airfield expansions. And then in 2019, we get a bit of a diplomatic snafu with uh, Secretary Pompeo and Vice President Pence. Pence claimed that Iceland had declined to participate with China and the Belt Road Initiative, um, when really Iceland hadn't made a decision at all yet. And so you get this big announcement, when a US leader speaks, it's gonna get global coverage, and caused a whole host of diplomatic problems, both for, China, for, well, for everyone, for China and Iceland and, and the US on that one. Um, Russia is not gonna miss out on the party either. Russia has a history of supporting Iceland with money uh, in, through economic aid and, and trade as well. So you know a lot of moving pieces in countries fighting over the, the same spaces. Norway is a little bit different. Um, so there's an uh, archipelago in, in Norway that is between the North Pole and, and Norway. Um, and there's a treaty that's going to give Norway sovereign control over this, um, this area. It's called the Svalbard, Svalbard Archipelago. And the treaty that has been signed governing the space gives nationals certain rights to access for mining and that sort of thing. Uh, but it's a very contested treaty and the legal aspects are heavily debated in the courts, especially with maritime and fishery laws. Because remember, you got to define that zone of where you can fish and who owns it. And as you imagine, Russia does not agree with Norway's decisions and boundaries. And so Russia has established a settlement uh, around what used to be a, still a functioning coal mine on the archipelago, 20% of the population lives there. And so you have Russia arguing with Norway about what to do with the space. China's also complaining about activities that restrict economic exploration in the interest of protecting the environment. And then Norway tries to establish a fishery protective zone that define, the zone is defined by historic activity, which is great until the space changes. And so you get again, a lot of disputes going through um, this particular area and Norway wanting more presence um, in the Arctic. So this will show you some of the different territorial claims. Um, the sort of orangish, tannish is Russia, um, and then the green is Norway. So that's probably the, the biggest dispute there. And then the red line is that nautical mile zone I mentioned. All right, looking at some of the shipping and oil spill risks, as we have more shipping routes, we also have the potential for more oil spills. And the US and Coast Guard, particularly the Coast Guard and NOAA, 
are working on these joint scientific research expeditions and doing oil spill drills to see kind of how they, they should respond. A lot of GIS mapping in the area, and there's a really cool program called the Arctic Environmental Response Management Application that will look at the unique ecosystems and think about how to mitigate potential spills. But with these oil spills, you have a really sensitive ecosystem that's at risk. It's a remote location, so it's an incredibly long distance for first responders to get to. There also are not enough ships with the appropriate clean up equipment right now. And then the weather changes, weather conditions will change very fast and are very extreme. So all of this is going to combine to be in a very difficult space um, to have a, have a spill and to try and clean it up. This will show you the different Arctic shipping routes and so you can kind of see where those are, are changing. Um, the red is the Northwest Passage, blue is the Northern Sea Route, and then you have some um, potential other ones that are coming up too. And then this will show you the projection um, of changes to the shipping routes over time. So on the left, you can see by 2020, the routes over the North Pole could open for ice breaking cargo ships. Oh, sorry, 2030, um, it, operating ice up to four feet. But then the one on the right, I think, is really shocking. So this is 2045 to 2060. And it says the decline of Arctic sea ice under moderate warming. Mind you, we're experiencing high warming, but if it was just moderate, ordinary cargo ships could go directly over the North Pole. This is a dramatic change in, um, in these potential spills. This is a website I encourage you to, to check out and, and click around, and it gives you an example of an oil spill in this particular sea, and you can overlay different layers of whether it's an extreme spill, what species are affected, so you can add these different layers of layers of birds, layers of whales, um, and then look at all the different factors of what's the risk of low-level concentration of surface oil, shoreline impact, water contamination, and then what the response itself would be. And so I think it's really powerful to see those visuals of just what a spill could do for all these different factors. And the world, it's the World Wildlife Fund that um, has this particular site that I think is, is really good. And so some things to think about for the, the future. Uh, Arguably, climate change is, I think, the biggest threat. Um, the US Pentagon has, an, has uh, declared this as a threat. We're going to hear a lot of talk about this, hopefully in the next week. There'll be a news battle between the infrastructure bill and um, I think what's happening in Glasgow. There might be potential cruise options as well on here. People do Alaskan cruises. Um, this could be a potential you know, economic growth there as well. The, we know the fisheries are moving, and that's going to have, obviously, ecosystem impacts, but also economic impacts with the, the region um, and the countries that are dependent on them. And then the global warming with melting sea ice. When you watch that movie, um, Chasing Ice, like I said, the photography is just unreal. And um, another really good one that I think gets on, on this with the shipping, it's called Freightened, like shipping freight. And that will sort of talk about the implications and I think environmental impacts. And so both of those are really good documentaries to see more about how climate change is affecting this, but also what the shipping industry looks like in, in general. Um, we're hearing a lot about that more now as we've seen the pictures of all the ships that are backed up on the ports um, and sort of the shortages there. Um, that's, you know, with limited shipping routes right now, these problems could all get much, much worse with the supply chain and, and the environmental impacts. And then the next kind of big area to think about are the effects on indigenous communities. Ecosystem-based management is becoming a much more dominant philosophy, which um, the, okay, the environmentalist part of me is really happy to see because I think it does a better job at just looking at the science or just looking at the social or economic factors. It looks at everything and thinks about how you manage the ecosystem. And this is the philosophy that the Arctic Council is going to be using. And so they're looking at um, biological, physical components of the system, including humans, sustainability of the ecosystem, um, how we can integrate the current state with some of those economic assessments, and then really valuing the, the cultural, social, and economic goods and managing the human activities. And so it's not prioritizing economics over anything else, not prioritizing the fish or the water, it's looking at all of those together. 
And then we get into the biodiversity effects of, of the shipping. We know with more shipping, there is a greater risk and almost inevitable uh, increase in oil spills. And so how are we going to mitigate those? How are we going to prepare for our response on those? And then uh, the habitat destruction. And so we had like a happy polar bear picture, so now you have a sad polar bear picture with sort of the foraging uh, with all of the, the waste here. Uh, but I think there's a lot of you know, potential for Arctic research. We saw the research stations. And what I find really powerful as someone teaching in this area, um, a lot more students are interested in it, especially with microplastics. And programs like my friends at, at Toronto, um, some of the top uh, Arctic and climate change experts in the world are now looking at the Arctic. And so, um, you know, she is able, she's actually my, she's very young, um, she is one of the IPCC peer reviewers because she's had so much primary data experience and such good, you know, essentially experience during her, her doctoral program that universities are really investing in this. And I think there's been a big educational commitment and uh, more attention. I don't have to necessarily convince students this is important. They're more, much more likely now to come to my class wanting to know more and, and thinking about it already. So I find that encouraging. I'm hoping that, you know, we see more of these joint initiatives and that um, there can be some good cooperation, I think, and it's not just diplomatic fighting or military disputes with some of these bases. The military security is always going to be an important aspect, and I can't you know, shy away from that. Um, the tone of the U.S. is very different now with the Biden administration, um, and so we'll see where that goes. We have a very different uh, Secretary of State different experience, different philosophy. Uh, and you know, we'll, we'll see you know, what happens with that. Right now, the Senate is holding up a large majority of our diplomatic appointees. So the cabinet's been appointed, but the deputies and some of the other staff are being blocked in the Senate. And so the US has a big diplomatic gap right now. But at least from the leadership and through the cabinet, we're seeing a much more I think open tone of, we're going to talk about this. We're not going to shy away from it, but we're going to talk about it and not just threaten to bomb you all the time. And so I think a yeah, different shift, but we're only 10 months in, 11 months in or so. Um, we'll see what happens this week with, um, with the Climate Change Summit. Last one, I wanted last picture, uh, last slide for you. This is a, um, she was 18, year old, 18 years old at the time, a young British woman named Maya Rose Craig. And she's a climate change advocate and a very talented ornithologist. She went on a Greenpeace Arctic expedition to investigate marine life in the region. This was the most northerly youth strike ever. And so, as you can imagine, how much further north can you go, right? Um, leave you with that, I think it's a powerful quote from her. She said, I'm here because I want to see for myself what's at stake as this critical protector of the planet. The Arctic Ocean melts away at a terrifying rate. Today, myself and Fridays for Future activists from all over the world are standing up to call for urgent action against climate breakdown. And so I think she, it's, you know, it makes me sound so old to say this, but um, when I see teenagers like, um, like Maya be so passionate about what they're doing, I think it gives you a little bit more optimism. These are huge problems, and no one person is going to be able to fix that. No one country can fix it. But I think when you have people that are so passionate and so dedicated to learning more about it, you know, we're not in, in terrible shape, and I think there's a lot of potential to make some progress in this area in the future. Open for questions. <laughs> um, so then um, I'll bring the microphone over to you, please. And then if you take your mask off to talk so the microphone can pick up your question. So who has a question? Me personally, or? No. <laughs> I'm like, no. <laughs> oh, oh, geez. <laughs> no. Um, I no. think the, the most that I, and I, I probably learned the most from, um, from my friend who does her research up there. Um, she's doing a lot of the core samples just to kind of see the projections with the change. It is hard to find, I think, some of the optimism. Where I see the most promise is um, some of the indigenous partnerships because that's a voice that hasn't been included fully, I think, at the, at the table. Um, and so I think you have people who have lived on the land and are connected to it in very different ways. And rather than have the 
I would presume, largely white scientists coming in and telling the indigenous people what their land is going to be like, you have more of a partnership and a collaboration. And so I think those research stations and, so my friend is doing her research in Canada, so I hear the most from the Canadian perspective, but um, I think, you know, even in the US, we're talking more about indigenous voices and indigenous inclusion, and that I think is gonna be a critical step going forward for learning about this area and um, I think just being more attuned to potential changes that, you know, they're gonna know if the caribou routes are changing. They're gonna know if the fishing isn't the same. Um, and that can clue us in much faster than long-term data gathering might. So that to me, I think is the biggest growth area, but um, the reality is that it's melting really, really fast and the global community is not doing enough yet. I get excited for the conference of parties every time it happens. Like, I, mean, I, just, I love this stuff. Um, I'd, I'd watch it all week if I could. But, um, you know, the, one of the headlines I saw this morning is that the commitments that the countries made to the Paris Agreement, they're not going to meet those financial commitments for at least another year, year and a half. And that's just the money that we pledged to a level that was already too low. Um, and there's some good stuff that's happened, but we have got to do more. And I'm, I'm concerned with China and Russia not going next week. Um, Xi Jinping, I do not believe, has left China since the pandemic. And so we're not sure how much of that is just pandemic precaution and how much of it is, I don't want to deal with climate change. Um, and Putin's Putin, so he just, <laughs> he's just not going. <laughs> I just wondered if you had um, some good news resources for this topic that we could follow. Yeah, I think um, the Arctic Council is going to be a good source. Um, the AMAP, let me get that. There's so many acronyms on this one. Um, I believe it's the Arctic Monitoring. Let's see. I guess we should get the right acronym for you. I think it's AMAP. Um, somewhere early in the notes here. Because that's a specific Arctic one. The IPCC is the um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, but that is not exclusive. Yeah, it is AMAP. Um, it's not exclusive to the Arctic, but I think IPCCs were good. Um, but yeah, AMAP is the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program. So I think those are probably my, my, my go-to ones. It's difficult to believe that there are people who still do not believe in climate change. Yep. We've had some in our government, yes. actually. Um, how far back have they kept um, conditions um, that they've have we would actually know, has there ever been a time in history when it's recorded that there has been this, not this kind or this severe, but um, difficult times to think that there certainly there might be a climate change. Mm -hmm. Is this the first? It's not the first. Uh, I'm not sure exactly when they started tracking the Arctic. Um, some of it goes back to actually when they were looking at the ozone hole um, and started getting more, more data um, in more difficult conditions on, on that. Um, I'm not sure when the Arctic monitoring started specifically. It's a, it's a good question. Um, what I do know in terms of the trends, and I think back to the, um, the Chasing Ice documentary, we are observing it at the fastest rate in, in known measured history. And some of it um, were the scientists that took part in that documentary developing cameras that could withstand the wind and the climate, which was a huge obstacle, and, and measuring it. So they would go and like place stakes, they would set up time-lapse photography, and you literally watch the glaciers melt. Um, but it's expensive to do the research and it's taken a long time to go up there and I think have the technology and, and equipment to survive. Um, 
I mean, it's you're talking at least decades. I would bet at least 40, 50 years on the, on the really low end. Uh, but I don't know kind of when they, they started that specifically. But um, for the living glacier people and, and climatologists now, um, they're really alarmed. And I mean, they've been alarmed for a while, but now they're like, no, really, this is the worst we've ever seen it. It is the fastest and it is the most extreme. And I think people are paying a little more attention because of some of those military options and the military implications. And part of me is like, I don't care why they care, I just want people to care. If it takes military threats and, and using Russia as a boogeyman, fine. Um, you should have cared about if the environmental effects um, or the endangered species from, from my standpoint, but you are seeing more interest now because of, of Russia and sort of the tensions with the US and Russia in recent years. Um, so like I said, you know, means in the ends are a different story on, on this one, but um, I think Russia may push discussion and action on this area, not necessarily for climate change reasons, but more for, for potential national security reasons. So we might get there a different way. Um, but you know, even some of the emission stuff, one of the big things they're expected to talk about next week are some of the global emissions because this last year was such an anomaly with COVID because you saw air quality at record good levels in, in some of these major cities because people stayed home and they weren't driving. Um, you know, LA and Beijing are two really good examples of that. Um, and so they're going to have to figure out how to build in this last year as a data anomaly rather than a representative data. Oh, say, see, it's getting better now when really it's not. We just were in the middle of a pandemic um, and not going anywhere. So um, we'll kind of see what they, what they look at. But it also, I think, showed the potential if we can get our emissions under control, if we can change transportation options, if we can become more energy efficient. Uh, there's a lot of potential for reducing some of the harms or at least slowing it down. Uh, can you tell us exactly where the research stations are located and what in, uh, no? <laughs> Probably not. I mean, I, honestly, I do not know, um, partially because the names are very tricky to pronounce, but there are a number of them, so I am not sure. So I know the, the one, um, none of it was one with the very first picture with the, the fishermen, um, that there's at least one Canadian station there, uh, but no, I, I am not sure on the exact locations. And what indigenous uh, people are involved in these? Um it really depends on where they are in the Arctic because you have um, a lot of different indigenous populations that are there. And so it just sort of depends on the community that you're working in. Um, yeah, it just, there's just a lot of variation on that one. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> It was an era that I, you know, I guess I didn't know a ton about um, indigenous groups up there. I was much more familiar with the U.S. First Nations um, breakdown, and I just did not know as much about the Arctic, um, especially with different countries and, and, you know, different communities. So it's been really cool hearing about the stories. And that's kind of my friend's, uh, her, a lot of her research is looking at indigenous partnerships with scientific uh, education. So she's... You said you had a friend. Yeah, I, I just, I, I know she goes to the Arctic to cold places, and none of it was one of them. Too. She, yeah, she could. I just didn't get names of kind of where she was, but yeah, could she. We find it on a map. Um, you, we we could, yes. Um, so I just don't have the names of, of her city. Um, her name is Bonnie Hamilton. Um, she is also one of the National Geographic. Um, I believe it's a research scholar. She just got another cool title. Not so, the what's that? Not the skater. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, she's she's done. She's one of the IPCC reviewers now, and has done a lot of really cool work. But um, she's studying under some excellent, like one of the top microplastics people, and um, at Toronto. And so, um, oh, okay. yeah. So there, I mean, she's she's from the, from Michigan, and yeah. So you know, she's like, I'm going from Michigan to Toronto. Um, but really, really cool opportunities. And so this is kind of where her her heart has always been with the with Arctic research. She thrives on the cold. So obscure, yeah. Know, I had no idea the scale of, you know, sort of how big the research opportunities were and multiple research stations. So she's actually gone out on research ships um, and been at some of the stations. And, you know, they, she does a lot of modeling, a lot of time in the lab. And then she starts using science words. I'm like, we are parting ways here. And I'm your policy friend, <laughs> policy and law friend. <laughs> I just was thinking, kind of chuckling about her because she's like 
a Greta Thunberg mm -hmm. for the Arctic. Yep. Um, which is young people. It's just really exciting, I think, mm -hmm. that these young people who really care. Yeah. And can, and obviously, she's put her caring into action. Mm -hmm. So. And that's, I think, the coolest part, you know, and I think um, if, if Bonnie watches this later, she did watch, you know, I talked about this in a different uh, capacity, um, and she, I think, um, she's like, I'm just doing what I love, and I, I don't think she would necessarily agree that she is such an ins inspiration, but, you know, I never knew anybody who actually went to the Arctic and researched. I had read about it. I had heard about it. I had never talked with anyone about, you know, just little things like how you suit up to go outside and, and what it's like being in that remote of an area and what it's like to do an ice core sample and to spend time in the lab and just really basic things. You can talk about this in the abstract, but it's, um, it gives you a different perspective to hear from someone who's actually going into, um, into these areas and seeing the effects firsthand and you know, and has the scientific knowledge and I think the passion to, to be a vocal advocate to change it and hopefully make it better. Well, just for a plug for our generation, <laughs> there are many of us that have been very concerned and very committed over the years, but I think that mm -hmm. the advent of social media mm -hmm. and the ability to travel so much easier and yeah. women getting into jobs that they never had before. Yep makes the young people more visible, but some of us have really been, we've been there. Absolutely. You know? We've yep. been here and we've been very concerned. Um, this might be a dumb question, <laughs> but are the oil spills that happen up there, are they from tankers that are hauling oil or is it freighters that run on oil and That's a good question. their oil for some reason gets released? I'm not sure on that one. I have not looked at the breakdown between those different different types of spills. Um, I'm not sure how much oil is transported through that area, but given Russia's resources, I would imagine it has to be some. Um, but that's really, I've never thought about looking at the two separate spill stats on that one. And I guess the reason I was thinking about it was that you said China and Russia had nuclear yeah. <laughs> energy, and I'm, you know, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, I was up at the nuclear plant in Two Rivers protesting, and I don't want to give any kudos to either China or Russia, but yeah. wouldn't yeah. if if it were fuel that we're getting um, spilled, then wouldn't the nuclear freighters really be better? Your attention, please. <laughs> services will end, including <laughs> checkout and other computer services. Please check out all materials prior to that time. It was well-timed. Um, like it, it, did, it did capture my attention. Um, yeah, I thought <laughs> this was the interruption on that one. Um, I think that, yeah, that would be interesting. I don't know in terms of the risk with a nuclear spill. Um, I mean, the nuclear could be safer, um, but at the same time, not knowing anything about sort of safety and construction, that how much confidence do countries have in Russia and China having safe nuclear icebreakers? I don't know. Um, I think people are concerned that there are first are nuclear icebreakers, and second, that those are the only two countries that have them. Um, because we just, we just don't, know, we don't know safety reports. We don't know kind of any, any sense of um, if they're better or, or not. I'm kind of mixed on it. Um, I, energy is the toughest unit for me to teach because there are no good answers. There are drawbacks and risks for everything, even for solar and, and for wind and, and let alone fossil fuels. So um, that's a, it's a tough one. Like if I had to pick between you know, diesel and, and nu nuclear, I don't know. I'm like, I'd rather your ships not be there. That's kind of my right, third choice right. on that one. But that's going to be something they have to deal with. You know, we don't have agreements for the, some of these areas. And if they open up, that's going to be a, a question they have to wrestle with. Are you going to allow nuclear freighters to go through, or subs to go through? How are you going to regulate them? What safety precautions need to be in place? What monitoring needs to be there? Um, we have UN, you know, we have regulatory agencies that can do that. Um, but I don't know to what capacity Russia and China have cooperated with those. Right. Uh, and my third and last thing is um, every time there's a new administration in the United States, everything gets changed. Yeah. And <laughs> I, you know, I mean, Trump was so close to getting, you know, gas drilling or oil drilling in pristine areas yep. and, you know, got him out just in time so that, that didn't happen. But 
in four years, which is going to be coming up sooner than we like, is that that could change again. Yeah. How can we keep things, you know, right and stable in our minds? Yeah, I think, and I think that's the biggest challenge was just the U.S. system of government and, and the way we're designed. Um, the first big thing is, you know, it's quite honestly, as long as the filibuster is around, it's going to be really difficult to get any of that passed um, because we're seeing legislation that in some cases has 80, 90 percent public support getting blocked by Republicans in the legislature because they're concerned about political implications for next year in 2024. Even though nearly the entire country, like taxing, you know, people who are making millions of dollars is one of the most popular policies in the country right now. And, and politicians are worried about that. Um, you know, harming their, their political careers, even though we know it has support. So when you get into environmental areas that can potentially be costly or cost someone money, like restricting an area for drilling, um, it's just, it's tough to get it through. And over time, we've seen much less bipartisan work and largely under, under um, Senator, or Senator Minority Leader McConnell, you've seen this refusal to discuss. And that, I think, is what concerns me the most, that you know, I am not Lisa Murkowski's biggest fan, um, but as Senator of Alaska, she is incredibly passionate about the area's resources. And she was willing to come to the table to at least talk. Um, now, she still was again going to lean a little more on the extraction wolf hunting side than I would have preferred, but I really respected her being part of that conversation. And I think... The, the only way to sort of get some of those legislative changes are to vote the people out who don't believe in them, who don't believe in climate change and who don't want to see these environmental protections. Um, that gets into more gerrymandering issues and falls down a real deep poli sci rabbit hole. But I think between, between voting and the filibuster, those are the two steps that have to happen before we can get some of that more enduring legislation. Um, but it's a different political climate now than, than when we had the Clean Water Act or Clean Air Act and incredibly bipartisan, you know, highly supported legislation. We haven't had those in a while. Um, it's been much more politicized really since Reagan. Um, it's kind of when that, that was the turning point um, with his administration. But I think you can get back there, but like I said, the filibuster's got to go and you've got to have leaders um, that are committed to making the bold changes that you need to have made and I'm not sure we have enough of those right now um, we'll see what happens with this infrastructure bill and how the wind inspires Joe Manchin tomorrow who knows um, Kirsten Cinema is another fun one who knows um, so you, you know you can't assume that any one party member is going to vote a certain way but I think voting is where it starts and putting people in there that are committed to making the changes that we need to see made. Any other questions? Nope. That's okay. a good one to end on. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank that? you, buddy.